Back a few years ago, I wasn't aware of how, you know, serious men ministers took this. I know that a few years ago, back, uh, I guess, in what they call the liberal period, there were certain things that I know that the leader of the church would voice his disagreement with, but I didn't think it was church doctrine. It had to do with our understanding of the how to apply the scriptures in Revelation uh, 2 and 3 concerning the churches in Revelation. And also about the place of safety. And, uh, of course, I know Mr. Neff still preached about the place of safety during that time, but I understand that several men were not preaching about the place of safety because they felt that and that was not church doctrine at the time. Well, I've always believed it. Another thing that uh, was tossed around during that time is that uh, we always taught that the letters to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3 uh, depicted church eras, that, you know, that there was like the history of God's church from the Ephesus era all the way through the Laodicean era. And I know that many believe that that was not true. Stormstone says it's true. And... Strong always has said, at least uh, as long as I've been in the church, that not only do these depict the eras of a chronological record of the history of God's church, but also that at any one time you can have either one of the attitudes of any of these seven churches. So things that were preached during that time that these only depict certain spiritual attitudes was also true, but uh, not only depict this, but also, as I said before, show the chron chronology or history of God's church. Today I'm going to concentrate on two churches because uh, we know for a fact that three of the last churches that are mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3 are going to exist at the coming at the return of Jesus Christ. In other words, uh, these churches will be in existence. These attitudes will be prevalent when Jesus Christ returns. Also, there are strong indications, and you can do research yourself, that even the Thyatira era is around. That attitude is still also around. Uh, I know I've known of members who were uh, members of God's church now who were members of the Sardis era. And while I was in Houston, uh, I know the, the church member's wife was a member of the Sardis church there. So know that they, they exist. I'm not going to concentrate today on the Sardis era of God's church, but I'm going to concentrate on two, the two last churches. Because we wonder we can chronologically follow all the churches, you know, the history, true history of the true church and other literature that we did have, we pretty much feel as though we understand uh, the first five or maybe six eras of God's church. We believe we are the Philadelphia era of God's church. Well, what about this Laodicean era that goes through a great tribulation? We believe it goes to, uh, through the great tribulation. Where are they? Mr. Armstrong has said, and this is certainly true, and I'll give you scriptures to back that, that the Laodicean church does its work during the Great Tribulation. But where are they if we're near the end time? And we can say, well, here's where the Sardis church is, and we are the Philadelphia church, but we don't know where the Laodicean church is. We don't know who they are. We don't know where they're going to come from. Perhaps there are people who are out there now who have not been baptized in God's church, and they're the Laodiceans church. Well, how do you become a member of the church unless you have God's Holy Spirit, unless you're baptized and have hands laid on you? How do you become a member of God's church? Because we're talking about a church of God. We're talking about the churches of God, let's say. We refer to the, 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 the churches in Revelation 2 and 3. As I mentioned before, both exist prior to the return of Jesus Christ. They do depict church areas. But I would like to ask you, what do we need to look for ourselves in order that we might be able to recognize whether we have a Laodicean attitude, or whether we have an attitude of Sardis, or whether we have a, Laod a Philadelphian attitude or a Philadelphian spirit. Now, as I read in the Bible, I'm going to read certain things in the Bible, and I'm going to prove certain things in our church doctrine. When I get to the point where I'm going to tell you this is what I believe, or this is my theory, or this is what I conjecture or speculate, I'll let you know. You can agree or disagree. But I'm going to give you something to think about. When I speculate, when I tell you what I think, that's my idea. You can accept it or reject it. It doesn't make any difference to me. I've got a right to my opinion. You have a right to your opinion. I respect your opinion. I hope you respect my opinion. But the opinions I'm going to give you are based upon Scripture because I'm going to hang right here in the Bible. I'm not a speaker by nature. 
take the Bible away from me and it's like an empty wagon, make, wagon making you know, a lot of noise. And I know that about me. Revelation, the third chapter, <clears throat> verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things say he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David. Of course, that's a quote from Isaiah 22, verse 22. And you can read back there and kind of research it and see exactly what it's talking about. There. It has to do with the keys to salvation, you know, the keys to the kingdom of God or whatever. You know, he said that in Matthew 16 also. I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Also, the understanding about who Israel is and this type of thing in prophecy. What David's uh, job is going to be in the future, we understand that. The key of David, he that opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man opens. Now this not only has to do with opening up an opportunity to preach the gospel, but when you fully research it, it also has to do with opening up your understanding to understand deep truths of God, opening up the way to you to come to Christ, or the way for you to come into the kingdom of God. He also shuts out anything that might endanger you, or things that would hurt you or harm you. If there are doors you think that you need to go through, and God knows it's going to hurt you, he'll shut those doors, and no man can open those doors. And that has even happened uh, as we have tried to preach the gospel in many parts of the world. Ideas that we have had, because God doesn't have a blueprint in the Bible as to, you know, the specifics as to how you preach the gospel. We have to use our minds and decide, hey, let's try this. Sometimes doors have opened, and sometimes doors have have shut. We have not been able to open those doors, and no man's been able to open them. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door. As I said before, it's a dual, open door to preach the gospel, also an open door of understanding, which I am coming to see more and more the longer I'm in God's church. I have set before you an open door. In other words, the one who is supreme here, the one who is able to open up your understanding, the one who is able to give you wisdom and depth is Jesus Christ. No man. Now, God uses men. Don't get me wrong. He uses men. But I'm telling you that Jesus Christ only is able to open up your mind to deep truths and deep understanding. And so he makes that very emphatic and very clear. I have set before you an open door, and no man can shut it. So you might think there are going to be men who are going to try to shut what God has given you, either by threats or intimidation or whatever. You don't know how they do it. Using the personages of men or authority or rank or whatever. Once something has been, you know, revealed to you by God and maybe they don't understand, they might try to shut it, but they can't shut it. It's no way, no way possible they can do that. Nobody can shut the door to, to preach the gospel if God wants to open it. There's no way they can shut down, you know, Ambassador College or shut down the Worldwide Church of God. In 1979, whether we had demonstrated or not, if God didn't want that college shut down, it would not have been shut down. If God didn't want the worldwide church of God to move, nobody, nobody could move it. If God wants the gospel preached, nobody can stop it. So it says, no man can shut it. For you have a little strength. In other words, you have very little influence, very little power, and very few in number. You have a little strength. And there are indications, and I'll read a little bit out of Halley's handbook here, that the Philadelphians, in the situation in which they find themselves, having a little strength, a little influence, maybe have a little tendency to become a little bit discouraged in here. So Jesus Christ here is encouraging the Philadelphians. He doesn't have anything to say about them in a, in a negative way. But when you're in the minority anywhere, and everybody around you is going another way, and you, know, you almost feel like, hey, am I alone? You need encouragement during that time. Jesus Christ needed encouragement when he, he was here on the earth. Elijah needed encouragement. All of God's prophets, all of God's people need encouragement. Mr. Armstrong needs encouragement. He appreciates the letters that you write saying you're behind him 100% or 110% or whatever. He needs that. He's a human being. And he's standing alone right now. All of his aides, all of his friends, all of the people that have been close to them, to him at the top, they've all gone. They're all gone. It's pretty, pretty lonely at the top. And you need encouragement. So God's encouraging, seemingly, and that's the way I view this. He's encouraging the Philadelphians. He says, uh, you have a little strength and have kept my word and have not denied my name. 
in works, you know, you deny him. In other words, they are doing what God commands them to do. They're hanging on. They're doing the work of God in their lives as well as preaching the gospel. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, those who say they have the way to salvation, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Because at the present time, it doesn't look like God maybe loves them. Maybe they're, you know, talked about and maybe by them being insignificant and have little strength, very little influence. That maybe those who think they know the way to salvation, who are in the majority, are maybe ridiculing or looking down their noses at those Philadelphians who are just hanging in there, you know, one step at a time, just doing the work of God. Just steadily plodding along. No fanfare, nothing fancy. Just plodding along. See? He says, I'm going to, they're going to know that I've loved you. Maybe it's not obvious right now, but they're going to know that, that I loved you. Because you have kept the word of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour of temptation or the great tribulation of the time of trial. From the first, I don't say the first day, but the first year I was in God's church, and I heard, because I read in the Bible also, that God was going to protect those people that are faithful. I read 1975 in prophecy and realized what was going to happen to this nation. I looked for that safe haven, God's church, because I didn't want to die. I didn't want to go through the things that I had heard that a lot of people went through during World War II. I was in the Navy with some Filipinos, and they told me about the Japanese playing funny games with babies, you know, throwing them up and seeing who they, who they could catch on their bayonets, see, and what they did to some of the other people, how they hid out in the mountains and this type of thing, see. And I, I, those things were in my mind. I said, I don't want to have to go through that. I'm looking for this safe haven. I learned about the place of safety. He says, hey, we're the Philadelphian church. I'm going to a place of safety. That's great. Because God does promise that. Which shall come upon the, all the world. There's not going to be any place to hide, except that you're in the, the skirts of Jesus Christ, or the skirts of God, where he takes a few and binds them up in his skirt, as he said. He says when he, when he protects uh, even those out of Israel. So it's going to come on the whole world to try them, to test them, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, as he tells the Philadelphian church. Hold that fast what you have. In other words, you have proven, you prove all things, you have tasted of the, the way of God, and you know that it works. Hold fast to those things that you've proven. Don't let them go, because there's going to be every attempt in the last days to try to release your grip on those things that you have held fast to, those things that you have proven. So he says, you hold that fast, what you have, that no man, no man take your crown. Because Satan uses men also. God uses men. Satan also is able to influence men, and Satan's able to use men. As Mr. Armstrong mentioned on the tape, you heard of those of you at Bible study, when he mentioned about, you know, that Satan had used some of the ministers in God's church. They don't want to admit that, but he did. I can see it. I'm not saying, you know, they were possessed of the devil. No, not at all. He was able to use those men. And they were ignorant of that fact because Satan is a great deceiver. Him that overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Now, he makes an interesting comment here. He that has an ear, let him hear. Now, God has to open up your ears where you can hear. What the Spirit says unto the churches, plural, it means all of them. Maybe one day I'll give you a sermon, you know, maybe unless you already had it. I have to go back and check the files and so forth. Very interesting, I think, uh, going through the attitudes in the seven churches in Revelation. Now, Revelation 12, just keeping the thought in verse 10 about the time of, of, of temptation. Revelation 12. In verse 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and, his, and the dragon fought in his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. And uh, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a voice saying in heaven, 
Now is come salvation. You've heard Mr. Armstrong refer to this. He says he wonders whether maybe this war has not taken place or is about to take place because of all the problems that we started to have in God's church about that, you know, a few years ago. It came as a big shock to Mr. Armstrong when he was in the Philippines. And um, word came to him of this great conspiracy. And he said, oh, no, he couldn't believe it. Now, the oasis of God's truth. What's happened? He was really shocked and surprised. And I've heard him say a number of times, maybe this has taken place now. Because we know there's going to be nothing but trouble and, and hard times once this takes place. We aren't sure, just speculating on this. It says, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Because that's his nature. He's always pointing the finger and looking at error, things that he thinks are wrong in people and accusing them, accusing them before God. Showing God where, how they don't need to be saved. How they've messed up. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of uh, their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice you heavens and you that dwell in them. Woe, a war, hard times to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knows that he has but a short time. The devil knows there's going to be an end of this age. He knows that. He knows there's going to be a, a time when he's going to be restrained for a thousand years left for a little while and then restrained for all of eternity. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child, or the church. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. And we feel this is speaking of the same event that's referred to in Revelation 3.10 where God says, I'm going to keep the Philadelphians from an hour of trial, that this is what he's talking about right here. To the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness. And there has been speculation that uh, we might fly out of here on some 747s or whatever. I don't know. Might be magic carpets. I don't know. But we're going to fly out some kind. I just have faith that, you know, that if I'm a Philadelphian, this is going to happen. As far as me using my mind to figure out how it's going to happen, I just don't waste my time with it. I can't afford to waste my time. There are too many things that are more important. I've got to make sure that I'm qualified to be there first. I'm not worrying about the method <laughs> that's going to be used to get me there. I might be worried about the method and have that all figured out and miss the plane. You know. <laughs> so I've got to make sure that, you know, I'm qualified to whatever method God uses. In fact, it might, like I said, it might not even be a plane. It might be something like the big Zeppelin, you know. That the Germans used uh, back years ago. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness unto her place where she is nourished for a time, which is a year, and times, the minimum being two years. Uh, until you add those two together to give you three years and half a time or half a year, three and one half years from the face of the serpent. So the church of God is going to be protected. Those faithful members, those Philadelphians are going to be protected from the wrath of Satan the devil, which is a great tribulation. And also the day of the Lord, which constitutes a year. And so you have two and a half years of tribulation, or two and a half or so years of tribulation, and a year of the day of the Lord, three and one half years in total. The serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And many times, in, like in Daniel 11, 40, it talks about a flood referring to armies or a means of destroying someone. Someone said maybe a flood of literature or whatever, we don't know. But anyway, it's a method to destroy the church of God. He tries to go after the church of God. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. In other words, they all went into a grave, or he was swallowed up, or buried. And the dragon was angry. He was wroth with the woman. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed. That's an interesting comment. It's almost like they're all fleeing together. Or well, the thing happened is the church of God, and all of a sudden, some go to a place of safety, and some are left. Some didn't make it. Well, this is part of, you know, my thinking in this thing. My thinking, I hope to get that straight, but I'm, my thinking is based upon what I read in here. See, this is not church doctrine I'm giving you today. I'm giving you something to think about. Based upon God's Word. And based upon things I have observed in the 20-some years I've been in God's church. And I'm still in God's church. I hope I always will remain in God's church. I won't boast. 
I've heard men boast, I'll never leave God's church. And where are they today? You know, so I won't boast. <laughs> you know, I'll do it very humbly. I hope I remain in God's church, and by the help and the power of God, I will. Not by my power. That I know. And I know, and I know that I know. So he went make war with the remnant of her seed, this woman's seed. Uh, which keep the commandments of God. We're talking about church members, Christians. And have the testimony of Jesus Christ. They understand prophecy. They have, you know, they understand a lot of things about the, the, the truth of God. But somehow or another, they didn't make it. I have a little note from way back, probably still inspired. I've got her seed, lay of the sins. And Mr. Armstrong said, now these people, this church goes into a great tribulation. Something went wrong. There was something wrong with their attitude. But there are indications. And I know from the Scripture, and not only indications from the Scripture, but by observation of the years I've been in God's church. And I have made this statement back in 1958 or 59 to my wife, very young Christian in God's church, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, you know, full of zeal and, you know, vim, vigor, and vitality for God's Word, full of first love, ready to take on worlds, you know, to obey God, willing to give up jobs, home, and everything for the church of God. And I go into the Chicago church... And I found everybody in there doesn't have that kind of zeal. In fact, there are some folks sitting in there who don't even agree with what we preach. And there are some folks in there that, uh, you know, could take it or leave it. And yet they seem very self-satisfied. They seem very content, like an old content cow, just going along. And I remember I told my wife, I said, you know, it looks like there are two churches. There are two spirits in this church. There are two different kinds of people here. I said, oh, well, maybe it's just me. But I moved, and I've been around. I moved to Mississippi, I moved to Alabama, and I moved to North Carolina, and I've been to Pasadena, California, been in Houston, Texas, been in Baltimore, and now I'm here, you know, in uh, Detroit. Same thing. I can still make the same statement. Some who have their minds alert and attentive and sharpened by the Spirit of God, others seem to be dull, yet they're happy and satisfied. There's no way you're going to shake them up. There's no way you're going to get through their minds. You can preach and preach and preach and preach. It doesn't make any difference. When I went to Houston, Houston was one of the oldest churches. It was the 14th church established in the United States. And I know there's nothing I could tell those folks that they had not already heard. Otherwise, I'd be preaching heresy. And I wasn't about to preach heresy. One minister said, I hate the smell of burning flesh, especially mine. You know. And I thought that was a classic statement. You know, one of the ministers who left. I was wonder why he left. So, you know, you're going to preach exactly what you've been taught. I hear Mr. Meredith's words ringing in my ears now. Preach as you have been taught. See? So I try to do that. But I've observed that in God's church. I have worked with people in God's church. And I have seen that. And I, I don't kid myself. All I do is open up the Bible, preach it. If it falls on deaf ears, it's not my responsibility. If you hear and fear, fine. If you hear and disagree and rebel, it's all right with me too. Because there's someone greater than I am who will deal with you. And I'll tell you, he really knows how to deal with you. And he's very loving. So I don't want to frighten you to where, you know, you're going to go to the boogeyman or whatever. See, he's going to eat you up alive, you know, and swallow you whole. No, he wants to see you saved. He wants to see you in God's kingdom. He wants to see Laodicea in God's kingdom. But somehow or another, all the years that uh, they've been preached to, it does not take effect on these people. So as I said before, this scripture here gives us an insight of what's going to happen in the last days. That the Philadelphians go to a place of safety, and yet there's a remnant who the, the devil is wroth with. He goes after them. And they have to experience a great tribulation. Okay, back in Revelation 3 again. Now let me read a little comment from Halley's Handbook. It'll be the only comment I'll make uh, out of Halley's Handbook. But I thought it was interesting because I have come to see what Mr. Halley says here to be true. Here's a comment he makes about Revelation chapter 3, uh, verses 7 through 13, the letter to Philadelphia. An humble but faithful church. 
So see, they are not braggadocio, or oh, we're the Philadelphians. There are indications that the Philadelphians don't even know they're Philadelphians. Because you see, their uh, signpost or their guide or the one that they're trying to emulate or the one that they compare themselves with is Jesus Christ. That's very humbling. And like as not, when they look at that, they're hoping that they make it. They're just hanging in there and doing the best that they can because they look up and they see where they're supposed to be, what perfection is, what maturity is, and they know that they've got a long way to go. And that's humbling to them. Plus, God has humbled them, see. He has humbled the Philadelphians. They don't, they don't like to aggrandize themselves. They're going to say, no, like the Apostle Paul, that it, that is in me, in my flesh dwells no good thing. O oh, wretched man that I am. And you cannot see yourself as a wretched man and be very proud. Because God reveals to you that you are wretched. And when God deals with you, God is, the, he is capable of humbling an individual. So these people have been humbled by God Almighty. That's what we're talking about. And Mr. Halley, who you know, wrote the handbook here, mentions, uh, oh, come on, you Mars, and humble but faithful church, content to exemplify the life of Jesus in the midst of a pagan and corrupt society, lovers of God's word, and intent on keeping it, greatly beloved of the, of the Lord, it says here, not a word of reproof. An open door, he makes a comment here that none can shut. God had, had warned the churches of Ephesus and Sardis against boasting of their influential standing. Here he cautions the church in Philadelphia not to be discouraged because they are nobody. For God is not dependent on worldly prestige. Now, I'm going to contrast this with something. You, you, you think about these words I've just given. I'm going to contrast this with something. To where I can show you, I feel, out of God's Word, how you can tell whether you are led to see it or not. Or how you can see or depict or see the lay of the sins. How you can spot a lay of the sin. How you can spot a lay of the sin attitude in yourself, and how you can spot a lay of the sin attitude maybe in others who will go to church with you. Show me, fella. Okay, I intend to. Stay awake. Pinch yourself, you know, or have your wife poke you or whatever, because I've got something I'm going to tell you today. My idea. We get excited about what we think, don't we? You know, ministers are that way. Uh, <laughs> the church at Smyrna had been told that they were to suffer persecution. Well, I won't go into any more of this. I won't go into any more of that, because uh, I don't have too much time. Revelation 3 again. Revelation 3. We're going to talk about another attitude. So I think we have in mind these are faithful people. They're humble people. They have not denied God's name. Mr. Don Waterhouse, when I gave this, not the way I'm giving it now, because this information, I mean, I just started to see some of this stuff about two or three years ago. But I know I was going through the book of uh, Revelation, giving a sermon on some information we had at college. One of the classes I had out there that I really enjoyed, and I uh, had the information, bought the book and so forth, so I decided to go through the series on the seven churches in Houston. And uh, we were in the church office there talking about a few things, and Mr. Don Waterhouse made a statement. He says, well, Ed, he says, Mr. Armstrong's about the only one who's a Philadelphian in the ministry. I said, what are you talking about, you know? And I got to think about what he said, and got to reading the autobiography. And, you know, it's amazing what I saw in the autobiography when I read it back a few years ago. There are things I never even saw in there before about the man's uh, attitude or what he sees or his approach to Christianity. Because, you see, out in the field, I never had too much of uh, uh, influence of that nature. I'd never had too many men who, dis who, who displayed that kind of a spirit and attitude. I'd been part of, sort of a part of a system that everybody said it was good. You know, I call it a sacred cow. Now, you know, maybe I'll offend some of you. If I do, I'm sorry, but just the way I see it, you know, I'll call it as I see it. Sacred cow. It's amazing how a sacred cow can deceive you and blind you. If somebody touches that cow or says anything against that cow, you're going to go get him. But I saw through it. I said, Don, you're right. I said, I hope I have that kind of a spirit and attitude. I hope I become a Philadelphian. And I got to, got to worrying me. And I got to thinking, you know, a lot of us are not on that man's wavelength. No wonder he says, there's nobody of you qualified to run the church because he sees things in us. As a loving father that he knows is wrong in a lot of us. 
And I've heard him say it more than one time. I have been corrected by Mr. Herbert Armstrong. He puts us in our places, brethren. And he doesn't care about our image and our vanity. I guarantee you. He'll get up in Bible study and talk about a minister, if he's wrong, in a loving way. He's not trying to put the person down. But he doesn't care about images at all. We do. We're worried about how we stand, how we look, and how we come across, and whether our voice is right, and whether we have our gestures right. Bull, you know, as far as Mr. Armstrong is concerned, as far as the Bible is concerned, and according to what the Bible says here about a Philadelphian Christian. So I learned a little bit. I got on my knees and I started praying. I says, God, look, I don't want to go through a tribulation. You know, now if it takes the tribulation for me to be in the kingdom, so be it. But if I can avoid it, Father, I want to avoid it. I'd rather be humble now. I'd rather you work on me now, Father. Give me my trials and my tribulations and my testing right now, Father. I don't have to go through a tribulation. I want a piece of the rock, you know. If that's where we're going, hey, I want to have my rock out there with my initials carved in it. E-N-M, you know, and B-J-M, my wife, and family, you know. <laughs> have our little, our little stake out there. So I'd rather have it right now. Anyway, like I say, I started thinking about that, and it starts to begin to... You know, I was beginning, like I said, to read the autobiography. I said, where did we go wrong? What's happened? Well, I see what's happened. And I hope you see what's happened, because we're near the end time, brethren. And if I can help you, I'm here to help you. If you reject it, you have every right to reject it. You're a free moral agent. It'll never be taken away from you. I will never force my ideas on anybody. I don't force them on my children, and I won't force them on you. I'm here to give it to you. If you act on it, then hopefully you will be saved. If you don't act on it, then you'll find yourself maybe in a great tribulation as a last resort to get you saved. Okay, but Revelation 3, verse 14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, judging. These are judging. You know, Laodicea means judgment or to judge. Judging. And this is typical of the attitude of Laodicean. They judge. We've had sermons. We've had directives in the, in the uh, Pastor General's report or the Pastor's report, I think, years ago. Sermons you probably had here about our people judging one another. Pointing the finger. The way it's used in the Bible is condemning, you know. We all have to judge. We have mind. We're going to become kings and priests and judges. We have to learn to think. We have to learn to work out our own salvation. So we have to make value judgments. That's not what I'm talking about. Judgment in the sense of you're condemning. You're comparing. This is don't do that. Now, we've been told that in the Pastor General's report, and we've been taught, taught that in articles, but the Bible is the one that teaches that. See, all we're here is to preach God's Word to you. Judge not one another. Condemn not one another. Because with the same uh, fervor that you judge or condemn, you also are going to be condemned. So you better be mighty careful. If you're a hard-nosed character and you're trying to make people do things like you think they should be done, I'll guarantee you the same thing is going to happen to you. Be prepared for it. Put yourself in the other guy's shoes for a change, because that's exactly where you're going to be. And you can put that in the bank. Now, whether you agree with it or not, like I said, it makes no difference to me. All I do is preach the truth, brethren. What you do with it, as I said before, you're going to have to stand before your Creator, and you are standing right now. There is no tomorrow for us. So this is serious business. You can play with it all you want to, but i tell you one thing, there is a payday coming. So he says to the lay of the sins, write, these things says the amen. In other words, I got the final word. And he has to say, this, say that to this church. Says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I mean, I'm from the beginning and also the ending, Alpha and Omega. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would, you were cold or hot. So we look at that and we say, well, you can tell Laodicean. I know when I was in Chicago, and if you didn't join Spokesman's Club, you were a Laodicean. It's a lot of pressure on the person. You know what I mean? That's a lot of pressure. I'm working like crazy. Two jobs. <laughs> and one time I was trying to go to school. I'm living in, you know, a, you know in, a, in, a, in a bad area. I can't afford a stick of furniture. You know, I'm working like crazy. Hardly had time to pray and study and meditate. When I'd pray, I'd go to sleep. 
So I learned how to kneel down in the middle of the floor, you know. And if I went to sleep, I'd, you know, crack my skull. You don't do that. You know, you lay there and you will not go to sleep. You get near the bed, you'll go to sleep. But if you get out in the middle of that floor and try to pray, you know, you'll stay awake, I guarantee. If you don't believe it, try it. And I worked two jobs. Now I was feeling bad. I said, well, if I, if I go to a spokesman's club, I can't take care of my family. And I've denied the faith and I'm worse than an infidel. But if I don't go to spokesman club, I'm a lay to see and I'm going to the great tribulation, you know. Help! You know what I mean? What do you do in a situation like this, you know? I figure, God, this is where the kingdom of God is. I don't want it. You can have it. That's exactly what I prayed. I said, if this life in this church is depicting what the kingdom of God is going to be like, I don't want to be there. Because this is too much pressure for anybody to take. And nobody has given me a helping hand. I've got to work it all out myself. So I figured it out. Later on, you know, I did become a member of the club, and I was glad I did become a member of the club because it helped me. I will say it helped me. It helped me immensely. It was the person with my kind of personality at that time. So we come up with ideas that we think makes a layer to sin. I'll tell you one thing, brethren, it's not what you think. And labelism doesn't mean that it's so. And I found that to be true also. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I am about to, as many translations say, spew you out of my mouth. Because you say, you say. Now, I'm going to tell you the attitude. I'm going to tell you how Laodicea, how they view themselves. They don't see that. Laodiceans don't see what Jesus, how Jesus Christ sees them. They see themselves, they view themselves by their perspective, by their view, by their um, criteria. Because you say, I am rich. Now, we're talking about spiritual richness now, brethren. We're not talking about physical richness, although physical richness is a part of it. And you go back and lay it a very rich area. They had eye salve or eye balm. They had, you know, beautiful uh, I mean, jewelry and all this kind of thing. Maybe one day I'll go into some of that historical stuff, maybe the Bible study. Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, they themselves are very, very self-righteous. They're very self-satisfied. And they have got the system, they've got the superstructure, they've got things that they can point to and say, this proves that we're right, this proves we're God's church, this proves God's using us. And we're okay. Sure they have it. Sure they got something they can boast about. A man that has no talents doesn't have vanity. It's a guy who has the talents he has to work with vanity. It's those who have something. They have to fight vanity and pride. That's why God calls the weak of the world. That no flesh can glory. So they say, I am rich and increased because they're very self-righteous. And God, Christ says, and you don't even know. So what I'm saying here now, brethren, is that you can be a lay of sin. You don't even know it. My job is to help you to give you some symptoms of a lay of sin attitude. You know, if you start having sniffles, that's a symptom you might be catching the flu, so you, you know, get you some orange juice or vitamin C, whatever you do, you know, whatever, drink liquids or whatever, and go to bed. Of course, you don't want to get the flu. Well, I'm going to show you something, some symptoms, as if you don't want to be a layer of sin, what you need to do. If you are a layer of sin, probably I'll, I just, you know, you don't, you don't agree with me anyway. So, what else is new? He says, you know not that you are wretched and miserable and spiritually poor and I've, I've looked these words I didn't look these words up yourselves I've used modern translations and so forth I didn't take the time to do it here because I'll be probably talking about these things in more depth a little later on anyway see if I see it but it's here in Detroit <laughs> I haven't been here about a month or so this year I didn't know it I thought I was going to the promised land when I came to Detroit <clears throat> I thought all these people are ready to go into the kingdom of God you know and I don't know why they sent me here but I know the same thing. It's, 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 it's worldwide, at least in my experience. It's in Atlanta. It's in Greensboro. It's in Fayetteville. It's in Baltimore. It's in Houston, Texas. It's in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> it's in Big Sandy, Texas, and Pasadena, California. These are the ones I know about, see. I don't know about Toledo and Akron and all these other places. It's in Bermuda. <laughs> At least I've seen it in Bermuda. Well, you say, maybe you're blind. Well, maybe I am. Pray for me, please. I'll pray for you. You pray for me. 
Maybe God will lift the blindness. I hope he lifts it off of you if it's there. But it's here. You're wretched. No, no, they don't think they're wretched. They think they're number one. One minister who left the church, I made a statement when we were going through this and embarrassed the college. And I thought about that. Is that makes a lot of sense. I wonder whether that's true or not. But it's, I found it to be true. He said, you know what? He said, the, Phil- the Laod- Laodiceans are going to think they're Philadelphians. And they won't know who they are. But the Philadelphians will know who the Laodiceans are, and they'll also know who they are by comparing what the Scriptures say about a certain attitude. See, they have far more insights because they're not blinded. Philadelphians are not blinded. Laodiceans are blinded. Now, it's not a blindness to where it cannot be healed, though. See, because Christ makes some statements here. In other words, it's not one of those blindnesses where, you, you know, you've got to have a serious operation or a cornea transplant or this type of thing, see. Because others I'm going to compare them with have that kind of blindness, but the church of God does not have that kind of blindness. He says, you're poor and you're blind and you're naked, spiritually. I counsel you to buy of me gold. That means Jesus Christ. Buy of me, nobody else. Because they already got some gold. They already have some gold. They already are rich. They already think they have spiritual riches. He says, look, no, that stuff you have is no good. It's, it's miserable. It's wretched. It's dross. It's no good. It's worthless. You buy of me gold tired in the fire. Not the riches that you have, because that doesn't count. Because self-righteousness doesn't count. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. The Apostle Paul said, yeah, I can look back in my background, my ethnic background, what I've accomplished and so forth, and I have something to be proud about, he said. I had the law, and I was diligent in this type of thing, and so diligent I even killed Christians. But he says, I don't want to be found having my own righteousness, which is by the law. I want to be found having the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Hey, you're talking about something that's 180 degrees away from your righteousness. But if you don't have it, then you're going to be self-righteous. And you're going to be very content, and you're going to brag about how great you are and who you are. And you're going to brag about your God, and you're blinded. So you buy of me gold tried in the fire, and that you may be rich, because you're not rich. And white raiment. They had these, was it black robes or purple robes? I can't remember now. I, I think it's in this. I won't take the time to read it. But they had robes. They had dyes there. I think it was a black dye or a purple dye. I think maybe it was a purple dye. Royalty. They had royalty. Christ says, no, throw that junk away and get some white robes, which symbolize righteousness. You might symbolize royalty, but I'm going to symbolize righteousness. Righteousness is the only thing that counts here. So you get you some white clothes, some white raiment, that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear. And anoint your eye with eye salve. So like I say, it's not a very, very serious blindness that can't be cured or healed. All you need is some wash your eyes out. Anoint your eye with eye salve, and that you may see. But when somebody is content and happy and they think they see, you aren't going to get through to them. No human being is going to get through to them. Jesus Christ has to get through them. As many as I love, this is a beautiful part here, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Very interesting comment made. Even the commentary said, they say, well, here's a church of God, and they don't even have Jesus Christ in their lives. They have a lot of form, but they don't have substance. They have a lot of facade, they have a lot of edifices, they have things that they can look to as righteousness, outward appearance and so forth, but no substance. Christ is not there. He's knocking on the door of the lives of the people of the Laodiceans, and they don't even hear because you know, they don't hear him knocking. There used to be a song back in the fifties, I hear you knocking, but you can't come in. You know, That's about what they're saying. Because we've already got Christ, we don't need you. It's a stranger out there, they don't even recognize Christ when he knocks. So he says, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me and so forth on down. Now, well, the main thing that I wanted to bring out, and I've mentioned it before, and you know, everybody, every commentary agrees with this anybody, this, anybody who reads the Bible agrees with this, is that once you become self-righteous, the, the characteristics Jesus Christ explained in Revelation 3 and verse 17, wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked, naked, they're the byproducts of a, of a self-righteous individual. Now, back in Matthew, the fifth chapter, Jesus Christ took a lot of time to explain 
the attitude and the characteristics of people who are self-righteous. Jesus Christ spent a lot of time talking about the Pharisees. I used to wonder, what in the world does Jesus Christ talk so much about Pharisees for? Because the attitude of the Pharisees is the same, same exact attitude of the Laodiceans. And I guarantee you that that exists in the worldwide church of God. Matthew 5 and verse 20. My observation. Not only my observation, brethren, but there are a lot, especially on the East Coast there. Especially on the East Coast. I don't know about, I haven't talked to many of you here. As time goes on, probably I will. But especially on the East Coast. I have been amazed at the insight of the brethren on the East Coast who experienced 1974. They already understand what I'm trying to tell you today. Maybe some of you already understand. They, are, they understood it before I did. Shows you how smart I am. But it shows you how great God is, too. Because that's the one we're here to exalt. That the great God in heaven has already given some of his people in his church insight to understand and to be able to see the Laodicean attitude in themselves and also in the church of God. And they have already, they already, when I be talking to some of them, I gave a sermon, and they said, well, we, you know, we, we, we agree, you're right. I've been amazed. But then why should I be amazed? Because God's no respect of persons. God's not an exclusivist. God doesn't have a special group of people and, you know, they have something special that the other parts of the family don't have. No way. Men are that way. Anyway, Matthew 5 and verse 20. I say unto you, and I can say unto you who are laid the sins, or if I am what I'm saying to me too, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness. So we're talking about righteousness. We're not talking about unrighteousness. We're not talking about evil, wretchedness. We're not talking about sinners, you know. We're talking about the church of the living God, people who have God's spirit, but who have let themselves get into a state of self-sufficiency and self-righteousness and a sense of contentment to where they are not reflecting the life of Jesus Christ. I mean, Jesus Christ is not living his life within them. They do not have the characteristics of Jesus Christ. They are religious. They have the truth. They keep the commandments of God, but there's something lacking in what they are. Hey, I'm going to tell you something. I don't know about here, but I have seen so-called Philadelphians get together. So-called. In sports. And in activities. I have seen carnality that you would not believe. And not only that, but I have seen it justified. I have seen people justify the carnality. Justify breaking God's spiritual law. Because, well, this is Mr. So-and-so. I don't recognize any Mr. So-and-so if I don't see Jesus Christ in him. To me, he's about like a cockroach spiritually. I step on them because you probably don't have them here. We had them in Texas. I guarantee you. We had the flying kind. We had the big ones, the little ones. They, they, they were in the trees and they come out at night. You go in the garage and open the door, and they fly all over the place, you know. Scared of living dead so that you haven't seen them. You don't like them, you know. I don't respect those things. Anybody who's car I don't respect carnality. I respect the human being. I love the human being. But carnality destroys. And when somebody justifies carnality, justifies wrongdoing because they are who they say they are, they are not anything, as far as I'm concerned, as far as the Bible is concerned. See, I've dedicated my life to follow the Bible, you see. Follow God's Word, not men. If men are wrong, men are right, right there with them. I'll go to the wall with them. Because they're following Christ, and I'll be right there with them. I'll die with them, cry with them, fight with them, eat with them, do everything else. You know, because they're my brethren, and I love them. But I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter the kingdom of God. I might add, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of Job before he was corrected by God, Job would not have entered the kingdom of God. Now, unless the lay of the sins of righteousness is exceeded, by what they have, they will know why they in the kingdom of God. And God's going to do to them the same thing he did with Job, the same thing he's doing with the Philadelphians. Because he's not, you know, God's no respect to persons. And he shows his love in exactly the same way to everybody. God's not hard to figure out. You don't have to have a Ph.D. degree to figure out God. 
That's why it's plain and simple. I've known people couldn't read and write and understood God's way and God's truth. If they're willing to pay the price, it's not complicated. That's why we're without excuse if we don't follow him. Because there's nothing complicated about God's way. Very plain. Very simple. Hard to do, yes. You need help. You need power of God. Luke 18. Luke, the 18th chapter. Some of the characteristics of Laodicea. Oh, self-righteousness. Didn't make any difference. Job was the same way. I have been this way. Probably am to a degree. But I know I am a lot less. <clears throat> because I believe myself that at one time I had all these characteristics. I was Laodicean years ago in God's church. I was taught to be a Laodicean. I was told if I had to become a Laodicean, I'd be a Laodicean. <laughs> you figure that one out. Because if I didn't do this and get in this group and get in this crowd, see, I was a Laodicean. Hey, you can have the crowd. Have it. You all can go into the lake of... You all can go through the Great Tribulation if you want to and pat yourself on the back. We're Philadelphian. Hey, what happened? What's all that fire doing around here? You know what I mean? I, I thought, you know, uh, I saw it. So I'm getting out of here. <laughs> See. Now, I'd be a fool to reject what God has shown me. Now, I'm not responsible for what you see. I'm responsible to God for what I see and for what I do. And hopefully I can, you know, sound an alarm to others. Luke 18, verse 9. And he spoke this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and, and also another characteristic of a, of a, a self-righteous person, they don't like people who are not like they are. Now, Christ used a very nasty term here. And despised us. Oh, no. I, I don't hate him. I love him a lot, but I don't hate him. I, you know, I, I can tolerate him. Hey, you can, see, you can call it anything you want to, folks. You can justify it any way you want to. I'm telling you, I'm calling it, I'm telling it like it is. See? That a self-righteous person does not have the capability or he does not have the uh, any to love others who are not like himself. So that's something God has to give. So he has to justify his lack of love or his lack of being Christian. See? Because he likes those who are like him. He likes those who think like he thinks. He likes the ones in his club and in his group and his little clique. Anybody outside the clique, you know. I've heard people, if you're not a member of a while, you're, you're nothing. Oh, is that right? Same old some garbage I heard way back years ago. If you're not in spokesman. You go to a club? Well, no. Oh, one of those, huh? You know. <laughs> that's right. Hey, that's Christian, isn't it, folks? If it is, you find it in the Bible. Because you're going to be judged by this word. I'm going to be judged by this word. Nothing else. You're not going to be judged by the word of Ed Mars. As Mr. Armstrong said, I'm not inspired like Paul was inspired. I make mistakes. I, I give, come up with my ideas. See, So when I speak, it's not God-breathed. Although some people have taken Mr. Armstrong's words as God-breathed, and some people have taken the words of ministers as God-breathed. But if it's not in this Bible, God didn't breathe it. A man did. You can follow it if you want to. It's up to you. It better be in the Bible. First Thessalonians 5 says, Prove all things. That was written to Christians. That wasn't written to prospective members. He was talking to the church at Thessalonica. Hold fast to that which is true. Reject that which is evil. That's a continual process because we have an adversary who's going to try to get us off the track. And he has. Now we're striving like crazy to get back on the track. We are on the track doctrinally. I'll have to admit that. We're on the track doctrinally. I won't say we're on the track spiritually. I say we're trying to get there. And that's my viewpoint. That's my opinion. See? From observation and what I see taking place. If I'm wrong, I don't, you know, it doesn't make any difference. I've been wrong lots of times. So that's nothing new. And I'm willing to change. I want to do what's right. He says they trusted in themselves that were righteous, they were righteous, and they despised others. This is one of their characteristics. I don't care how they cover it up. I don't care how they, you know, dress it up or whatever with self-righteous garment. Still, if you don't, if the well is dry, it's dry. I don't care what you put in there to paint it and make it look like there's water. It's not there. And when you know the water that comes from God, you recognize when a person doesn't have it. Two men went up into the Pharisee to pray to one a Pharisee and the other a publican. 
Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not as other men are. That's good. I'm glad about like other men are also, since I have God's Spirit. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this publican. You know, this guy had deep-seated inferiority complex, so he had to have something that he saw within himself to make him feel greater than other people who were around him. That's why they had their little group, you see. They kind of encouraged and flattered one another. They were all right. They never repented. They justified what they were because they were in the hierarchy. They were the, they were the leaders, so to speak. They're the ones that people look to. He goes on and talks about things that are good. This is righteousness. This is, I, don't, I can't knock this. I fast twice in a week. Boy, that's great. I give tithes of all that I possess. That's what you're supposed to do. And the publican standing, and this guy, you know, he's a man, I, you know, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't think I'm going to make it. Because he was honest with himself. He knew he was not living up to that. The Pharisee made him feel horrible. And that's one another. This is another characteristic of a Laodicean. When you're around a Laodicean, they make you feel very unrighteous. <laughs> they make you feel like something's wrong with you. You, you, you wish you could be as good as this Laodicean is beside you. And so the publican felt that way. He, you know, he felt real bad. He says he wouldn't even lift up his eyes into heaven. He felt so bad. And smote upon his breast and said, God, help me. Be merciful to me, the sinner. And you know what Christ says. And Christ makes a statement. For everyone, verse 14, that exalts himself. I mean, we're talking about religious people, folk. We're talking about a man who is religious. We're talking about a man who fasted, who tithed, who kept the Sabbath, who kept the holy days, who helped the poor, and who gave alms of all that they had and all this kind of thing. They did. They tutored them. They gave. They helped people. Sure they did. They helped them and they were proud of it. They were proud to be humble, you know. They were so humble they were proud of it, you might say, in their own eyesight. He says that for everyone that exalts himself shall be abased. That's what's going to happen to Laodicea. Shall be abased. That's what happened to Job. That's what is happening to you if you are a Philadelphian and God is working in your life. You are going to have a rough uh, road to hoe, as they say, farm, farm terminology. And that is for your benefit. You'd better get it now than later, because you're going to have to have it. And if God is working in your life, what He's doing, He is humbling you that He may exalt you. But if you are proud of what you are, you bragging about what you have, and you think you're great, and you're looking at other people who are not as good as you are, you have got a day coming when you are going to be abased. You are going to be humbled because there are, there's not going to be any proud person enter the kingdom of God. None. Not any. So if you want to get there, you're going to have to be humble. And he that humbles himself shall be, not now, shall be exalted. That's what God tells Philadelphia. They're humble. You shall go to a place that you shall walk with me. This type of thing. See, Okay, Luke 16. Another characteristic of Laodicean or self-righteousness. They maintain their image before men. Now, I've seen this. Folks, I have seen this. I, I mean, I, I have actually seen it head on, face to face with it. To where in order to maintain an image, you kind of evade the truth. Truth makes you feel uncomfortable if the truth is going to cut through you. It's going to cut down through the mar of your bones. If it's going to make you look like you are uh, not what you claim to be, you will take that sword and you will get a, get a shield there to protect your image. Okay, Pharisees no different. I can, I can understand this, too. I can understand this. I've been in this boat before. A lot of us have. Verse 13, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the others. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve, you know, the physical life or aggrandize yourself in the physical life and serve God too, because God's way is the way of humility. God's way is the way of self-denial, putting the self down. The self is supposed to be become converted. You can't hang on to something that needs to be converted and expect to become converted. You've got to be willing to give it up. And when it gets way down deep inside of you to where you're going to be embarrassed or you're going to be hurt or whatever, you have got to be willing to give it up and take the embarrassment and go on. Because that's how you grow. You hang on to it 
God's going to make you loose his hold before you enter the kingdom of God. Verse 14, And the Pharisees also, I'm just giving you all the characteristics of self-righteousness. And this is true. And I've seen it. I've rubbed shoulders with it in God's church and have been a part of it in God's church. Myself. Didn't see it too much at the time. I see it clearly now. By the grace of God. Not by anything I've done. Who were covetous? Well, you saw I've got to set a good example. Well, that's why I have to drive a Cadillac, you see. And uh, this is why I have to live in this uh, $500,000 home over here because uh, I have to set a good example. See, I know all the arguments. I know all of the, the things that you use. You get on your knees and say, God, what in the world am I doing? I'm not even, we're not even able to eat, maintain this image. And where do I get to? Where do I, I go buy this house for? Why not stay in that little shack, that little place I had over here that was a little smaller? You know, but my image, you know, was, hey, you know what? Because I'm covetous, that's why. Let's call it like, let's tell it like it is, Ed. No, I'm in the church, I have God's spirit. Yeah, but you're still covetous. Hey, you can see it in yourself. Keeping up with the Joneses. Back years ago, I hope it isn't happening now, we had uh, men, deacons, who were, you know, almost starving, trying to keep up with the minister. The deacon had four or five kids, the ministers had none. I worked with a minister one time that had no children. I always had to go out and eat big, expensive places. I said, hey, wait a minute, Buster. I can't afford this. So you're a pastor-ranked minister. I'm a P.E. with four children. I have six of us to feed. This is you and your wife. Hey, there's no way I can keep up with you. Hey, but if I don't keep up with him, then he won't like me. Well, that's tough. If I take kid, uh, food out of my kid's table, off the, off the table for my children, then, then God's not going to like me. So I had a choice to make. Who wasn't any choice to make? As far as I was concerned, later on the person understood and so forth. But the Pharisees were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, You are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Hey, those are sage words. Mark them in your Bible. Mark them in your Bible. What's happened to a lot of the people that were highly esteemed among men in this church? Highly esteemed by me. I'm not, I'm not kidding. Highly esteemed by me. He used to pray, God, help me to be like Mr. So-and-so. Oh, God, help me to preach like Mr. So-and-so. Give me the mind like Mr. So-and-so. So I can grow and be a pastor. Or so I can grow and do this. You know what I mean? That's probably the, the internal motive that I had because I was looking at men. Yeah, that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in God's sight, and God's able to reveal it. But one, as I said before, one of the characteristics of Laodicea is the same characteristics of anybody who's self-righteous. You really want to look good in the sight of men. You want the praise of men. I have been in churches. I work with ministers who felt like, you know, everybody in the church should be ordained a deacon because in that man's mind, uh, deaconship was a badge of spiritual growth. Now, you find that in the Bible, would you, for me? That sounds good, doesn't it? We use terminology like, well, he's doing the work, so we're going to recognize him doing the work, and we're going to ordain him a deacon. Where do you find that in the Bible? Where do you find that in the book of Acts? What were the qualifications in the book of Acts? Now, I had to correct a lady one time in a deacon's meeting on this. She says, Ed, have you thought about ordaining so-and-so a deacon? I says, no. Well, give me your reasons why. She gave me her shallow reasons. Well, he's serving. He's on oh, yeah. I said, but the qualifications are he's got to be full of wisdom and the Holy Spirit, and he's not. Later on, she saw what I was telling her. Because I almost had to disfellowship him at one time. God just revealed it, I think, for her benefit, not for me. I didn't need that. I think for her benefit. She, she learned to respect me a little bit more after that. I heard her feelings. I said, he's not full of wisdom in the Holy Spirit. That's, that's the criteria God gives for ordaining somebody. It's all spiritual. It's not physical. It's not window dressing. It's not impressing some man. That's carnal. It's not of God. And there's been far too much of that in God's church. And Jesus Christ does not like it, brethren. Whether you like it or not, Jesus Christ does not like it. The qualifications are spiritual. 
And the reason why they're spiritual is because the position to serve does not go to the head of a spiritual individual who's been conquered of Jesus Christ. He does not use it as a stepping stone to aggrandize himself or to be tough on other people, show other people how bad he is. Yeah, he's bad, all right. He stinks. He's rotten spiritually. You look in the Bible and see what the qualifications are. Are we following it? I'll let you judge. So I told her that. Well, she didn't like it. I don't care what people like. If you don't like the Bible, you're mad at Christ. You aren't mad at me. I don't care if the sacred cow's been going on for years. Let's get rid of the booger. You know, he's not something we're supposed to worship. We're supposed to worship Jesus Christ and worship God. Not things men stand up as edifices, but this is what happened, brethren, to the Pharisees, and this is what happens in the Laodicean church, or the Laodicean spirit, the Laodicean attitude. And I guarantee you it is here, now, from my viewpoint. I told you before, this is my viewpoint, based upon things I've seen in God's church. And if I shake up a few people, that's good. That's what I'm here for. I'm not here to play. I'm not here to follow the crowd. I'm not a crowd follower. If I sought to please men, I couldn't please God. So I don't seek to please men at all. I seek to please. I seek to serve and seek to help. I like for people to be happy. But I would not serve people just to be serving people to get a pat on my back. Or to get a star on my little, my little uh, merit badge. Get a merit badge or a star on my little Sunday school book or whatever. See, Those things don't mean anything at all. And so he makes that statement that is absolutely a true statement. They had a religion in which fear was a dominant factor and a major part of their religion. Luke 22. Luke, the 22nd chapter. Now, one reason why they wanted to get rid of Jesus Christ is because they didn't trust God. They trusted in themselves. They trusted in their system. They trusted in the things that they had set up as being righteousness. Luke 22 and verse 2. Now, the, in verse 1, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Feared the people in what way? Feared losing the people. They feared that their power would be taken away from them. I've seen people who will hang on to their power. I've seen people who would use Y-O-U as a means of uh, proving to themselves they were a good minister. That's sick. I've known people go out and recruit people to play basketball so that that church could win. I've seen it. I'm not talking, I'm not whistling Yankee Doodle. I was going to say Dixie, but I forgot. That's right. I'm talking about what I've seen. And I'm not the type of person to say, oh, I didn't see it. Yeah, if I saw it, I saw it. Now what? Let's deal with it. Let's work on it. If you don't like boldness, then don't come to the East Church. Go someplace, and I'm, all of us should speak boldly, but if you think I'm too bold, then, you know, you're free to go any other place you want to, where you can hear soft music, da, 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 dee, 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 you know, and you can just, oh, and it's so beautiful. Oh, I love the way he speaks. Oh, it just makes my heart feel so good. I'm not here to make your heart feel good. I'm here to get your brains in gear and get you to thinking and analyzing some things and getting on your knees. If the shoe fits, if it doesn't, then you pass it on to somebody else. But make you, I'm here to try to make you wise. No, they feared. It was a religion of fear. They feared the power base. They feared if they weren't up with something that made them feel great, that they, they wouldn't be anything. You know. And so they wanted to get rid of Jesus Christ because he was speaking. He was speaking the truth. <laughs> and they feared, hey, you know, <clears throat> we better get rid of this guy because we're going to lose our power. We're going to lose our members. I've known ministers fight over. Deacons and the elders. I, look, if I came in this area and Mr. Wooten wanted all the deacons, have it. He can have them all. That's right. Have everyone. I, if God's going to use me, he'll bring me some new ones. He'll call some more new people. New blood. That's right. If that guy is that sick, let the sick old have them, you know. Let him have them. I'm not going to fight over people and personnel. Maybe that's a good thing anyway. Start from scratch. I'd love that. Hey, well, I, man, I like that. Pretty good idea. I heard that happen in one area. I said, hey, you know, this guy may be better off. <laughs> Get your own elders and deacons, you know, to work on your team, you see. Because if you're preaching the word of God, that's all right. God's going to, you know, he'll send the people there. You'll have people to help you. God will send them. Don't play any politics. Don't worry what men do. I feel sorry for them, really. You know, I hate them. I feel sorry for them. John, the ninth chapter. 
I don't have time to go through everything, but I'd like to be in, in the incoming Sabbath, and maybe some of these things should be thrown in, other sermons, because I have a tendency to throw them in every once in a while. John 9, verse 22, and it, it, it was... Uh, is that the one I want? <clears throat> Wait a minute now. That doesn't look right. John 14, I know it's in that one. Maybe I think I put a wrong scripture down here. Maybe it's just as well. John 14... Yeah, this is this will suffice. John fourteen. I'll be. I think I I wrote the. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Verse forty two. Yeah. Nope. I did write something wrong then, didn't I? Well, anyway. John four. I'll get it. John four. No, it's in John. <laughs> Still not it. That's still not it. I don't know. Well, anyway, what I was—the point I was trying to get. Maybe I'm, I probably I'm probably in the wrong book. The point I wanted to get across was that the people so feared the Pharisees that it was one incident to where a uh, lady was healed. Now, I don't know if this is it or not. Where a lady uh, son was healed, and they were afraid to admit that Jesus Christ had healed them because they were afraid of the Pharisees and they were afraid they were going to get put out of the church. They were afraid that they were... In other words, there was such fear of the Pharisees, there was such fear of these self-righteous, carnal individuals that the people were afraid to tell the truth because they feared if they told the truth they'd be put out of the church. I'm giving you something to think about, brethren. Hope I can find that scripture. It's up here, a little mark up here. I'm going to keep turning here while I'm talking and see what see if I can find it. Uh, I wrote these things down very hurriedly. And I used to check I used to double check these things while the sermonette's going on, but I didn't. I was listening to the sermonette today because I am here. But anyway, that that, that 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 example was there. Now you compare that with first John, the fourth chapter. I know it's in John, but I just my eyes just don't uh, see it right now. In other words, um, and there were a couple. There were a couple of cases, and uh, like I said, I didn't write down here. A couple of cases where the people so feared the Pharisees, they feared the Jews. They said they feared the Jews. Is what word is used? That they feared the Jews. That they may be proud of the synagogue, so they crawfished around. They were afraid to be themselves. They were afraid to be honest. Would you say? Nine John nine twenty two. I was there then, wasn't I? Well, you can have mercy on a little one eye character anyhow. I only got one eye. And sometimes, sometimes it doesn't pick up like it should. Okay, yeah, John 9. I was looking right at it. Didn't, I didn't uh, recognize it, I guess. Yes, that's it. And the mark is right there where I said it was going to be, too. Okay. <laughs> okay, John 9 created these words, spoke uh, his parents. Oh, no, no, let me go back and said, verse 19. They asked him, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How uh, then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we don't know. They lied. They knew how he was able to see, but they didn't want to get, they didn't want to speak the truth. They were scared that they were afraid to tell the truth. I'm telling you, brethren, in any church where you are afraid to be honest and forthright, you have all, that church has all the earmarks of the lay of the seeing attitude. Now, I can say, you have to agree with me. I'm telling you, that's all. You've heard it today. February 13th, 1982. You heard it. That's all I'm responsible for. I'll give you the message. That's all. I've done my job. If you end up in the Great Tribulation, it's your fault. Not mine. I can stand before God with a clear conscience. If God, I, I said it. Because if I'm wrong, I want to be corrected. Come up and correct me. Fine. But you better have some heavy stuff. You better know where you're coming from. Because I'm not speaking things that I have figured out myself. I'm not that smart. Not in this kind of stuff. Maybe the electronics and this side. That's where my natural talents are. Science and math. You know, fix it. I can fix things. I don't have a natural knack for that. I don't have a natural knack for this. I know I'm a square peg in a round hole. I know that. Naturally. These words faked his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess. See, these guys, you think these men were fair-minded? 
They were already prejudiced. I've been to kangaroo court among so-called Christians. They already had planned in their own mind what they were going to do before they ever got there. They already knew what they were going to do. They weren't listening to the facts. They didn't want to get input. They were in a pet on the back. They weren't in agreement. Well, they got the wrong man. So one asked me, he said, did you say what you say before going to church? I said, I'm saying it before Jesus Christ. Sure, I'll say it before Mr. Garner and Mr. Herbert, I'm talking to anybody else, because I believe. And I fear God more than I fear you. Well, don't you? I didn't. <laughs> Well, say one thing, you know, kind of, and they scared me on the council, on the, on the high tribunal, and they had to speak up, speak the truth. Well, I'm not, you know, not that way. My heart makes me even fast, my mouth might be dry, but I'm going to tell her, like it is. I make mean, people going to hit me across the head, you know, whatever, I'm going to tell her. If you can show me where I'm wrong, I'll change. But in the kangaroo the court, they can't show you where, they're, where you're wrong. But see, this is what the Pharisees were like. See, they had already agreed. Already, if any man did confess he was Christ, he would be proud of the synagogue. Don't think the people didn't know that about them either. They knew what the Pharisees were like. They didn't trust the Pharisees. The Pharisees said, tell me the truth. If I say the truth, you won't like it. Why? You don't end up in a lake of fire to tell lies. They're not very false witnesses. Take your punishment. Certain people in the church in the book of John, First John, First John, Second John, one of John, Third John, the Epistle of John. There are people who are standing up for the truth and put out of the church. They were disfellowshipped. No, they put out of the church really? <laughs> no. Because John says the true believers were put out of the church. They were put out of the congregation. They were put out of the fellowship of the church. But they, you can't put a person out of the church by telling them they can't fellowship. Only you proud of the church is if God takes the Spirit away from you. That's when you're proud of the church. The man who was disfellowshipped in 1 Corinthians 5 was not proud of the church. He was disfellowshipped. Because he had, the, he had the, because he had the Spirit of God, he repented and came back into the fellowship of the brethren. That was therapeutic for him to shake him up, to wake him up. See? But he was not put out of the church of God. Because God didn't take his spirit away from him. Because he had taken his spirit away from him. How in the world could he repent and come back? You figure that one out yourself. <laughs> anyway, I said First John 4 and verse 18. Oh, my. I don't have time. Well, I'll finish this some of that. I'm just getting started, really. First John 4 and 18. That's, that was my introduction. I was just going to get in Matthew 23 and give you my sermon now. First John 4. But I won't hold you. First John 4 and verse 18. Maybe I'll finish it next week. There is no fear in love. Now, we're talking about Philadelphia now. Philadelphia don't walk around in fear. Fear of men. Fear of the future. Fear of the economy. Fear of the great tribulation. You know, walk around in fear. No, it says perfect love. This is what God... There is, he says, um, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. You cannot have a fear of religion. You cannot be afraid of men and have the love of God. The two don't work together. It's like having night and day working together. You can't one view one's there or the other's not there. One or the other. You can't have, you know, the black white, or what's this boy, the the, the barefoot boy, you know, stood on his uh, shoes or something as he as he stood there standing. I mean, sat there standing on the floor. You know, all these things that don't make sense. I've heard it now. I can't remember it now. You can't have things like that. You can't have fear and have love too. So you can say, well, I, I know I'm a Philadelphian. I'm scared to death. I know I have love. Okay. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. There is no fear in love. See, these scriptures used to bother me. Because I analyze myself according to God's words. So something doesn't add up here, God. Something does not add up here. Now, I said, God, you helped it to add up here. Well, God has helped it to add up. Not only, not only me, but several others. There is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear, because fear has torment. That's why I pray to God and Look, Father, if this is a picture of the kingdom of God... If we're living a life as a family and brotherly love, and this is a, and I'm experiencing it, I don't want to live forever. I don't want to live in torment, because fear does have torment. I don't want to live in torment all of my life, for eternity. And I asked God to wipe me out. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be in His church. But I says, no, I know there's nothing, there's not nothing wrong with you. We're in something wrong with us. 
There's something wrong either with my understanding or how it's being preached from the pulpit. God, show me what you're like. As Job said, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear. Now, God, reveal yourself to me. Let me know what you're like, like you did to Job. And if I've got to go through what Job went through, then so be it. Well, God answers prayers. That's all I can say. He answers prayers. Fear hath torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. You're not growing in love if you have a lot of fear. So you cannot have a religion like the Pharisees had where there is fear. And also, call yourself a Philadelphian. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.